What's up, Facebook Live? How are we today, everyone? I hope everyone is doing well. Uh, not just Facebook, but whoever else is watching this, whether you're watching this on YouTube, on Instagram, uh, wherever you're watching this from, uh, thanks a lot for tuning in. Um, interesting day it is. Uh, it's funny that we have Tuesday Night Lives and the RBA uh, always does their, um, you know, their... Uh, change in monetary policy on Tuesday and today is one of those days but uh, just going to wait for a few of you guys to hop online it appears that it's a little bit slow on getting everyone online tonight but uh, as you guys come in we'll start getting in to tonight's episode so uh, hey everyone hey Gemma Gemma's on the other side of the screen today last week she was here uh, in uh, in Facebook land. Uh, Craig, hope you're doing well there. Um, yeah, seems pretty slow. Everyone's out and about and not watching Facebook today, or they're censoring us. One or the other. One of it's happening. Anyway, I've waited long enough, and uh, those of you that are coming later can come and join on later and watch it in replay. Um, so yes, uh, we have the RBA came out with a decision today to increase interest rates uh, by another half percent. And um, I always thought at the start that they would only be able to move them by about a half percent, uh, by two quarter percent basis, two 25 basis point uh, increases. Otherwise, the whole complete financial system will fall apart. And it appears that the whole financial system is falling apart and uh, I'm going to take a deep dive into that today, share with you um, some of my research, some of my thoughts, some of you know my predictions on where we're at. And uh, for those of you that aren't registered tomorrow night, I have a webinar talking about how to take advantage of the current market, the things that you should be aware of in the current market, and uh, yeah, how whatever else is happening out there. So make sure that you do subscribe to tonight, tomorrow night's webinar. It will be a big one. So getting straight into the interest rates. I've got lots of documents here and uh, I'm just going to go for a little walk down memory lane. A lot of people say, you know, Nathan, in the 1990s, interest rates were 18% or 20% or whatever the case may be. And uh, let's go through every single rate wise, every rate hike, um, and the time that it took for the market to increase and to decrease. So let's start off by putting it onto a little chart. I do have a chart here. I don't want to get these messed up here. Um, so we do have a chart. Uh, this here is from straight from the RBA's website. Uh, where interest rates were almost 20% back in 1990. They came all the way down to less than 5%. It appears about 4% they went down to, then up, then down, sideways, up, down, sideways, and down to zero. So where do they go from here? That is a question over to the decision makers that, uh, that do pull the, the levers. But um, I want to go through, because it is interesting when you look at it, and this... Uh, this page that I've got here is, um, I just went into uh, Google maybe about 20 minutes ago and got Carolyn from my office to print out this because I know it exists. I've watched it a lot and um, I've looked at it and referred back to it a lot over the last 15 years. So this here um, is not the cash rate target. It's about historical interest rates something i typed in at the rba and it came up with all these pages that just have data it's just raw data so currently the uh, interest rates in australia now is 1.85 percent that means that we have gone up since the 6th of april four times in four months being 175 basis points so that's almost two percent we put that in perspective we're now at 185 basis points but we used to be at 10 so 120 days ago, we were at 10 basis points, and now we're at 185 basis points. So a lot of people are scared. Uh, a lot of people are feeling the pinch. Uh, a lot of business people uh, having troubles in their business. Um, I just saw today that um, I think it was uh, Metricon, a news article that Metricon had um, sacked 
two thirds of its staff today, something along the lines of that via a Teams meeting. Um, so there's a lot of businesses out there that are feeling the pinch now. So tonight's episode is about us going into a massive recession and, um, and you know, what to watch out for and should you be scared or should you not? And I think for a lot of people, it will appear as scary what is happening. Um, rest assured from my side, I've got about 20 mil worth of debt. I think it's, I don't even know how much, maybe like 17 mil worth of debt now. So every time interest rate goes up by 1%, my bill goes up by almost 200 grand a year. If it goes up 2%, then that's 400 grand a year. If it goes up 5%, then it's a million bucks a year. So if anyone was to be concerned, it would be myself. And uh, I'm not concerned at all at this point. I'm actually quite chuffed because it is a part of the cycle. And um, I'll give you my prognostication tonight about how I see that panning out. Um, but tomorrow night on my webinar, I will be doing a lot more detailed analysis of data and all that sort of stuff. But looking here, so in the last four months, interest rates have gone up from 10 basis points to 185 basis points, which is really absurd. Yes, they're trying to tame inflation, but it's causing other areas in the market. So if we go back and look at this sheet here, this is um, the last four months uh, worth of interest rates. And this is where it's been for the last uh, since 2nd of September 2020. So it's been at 10 basis points for almost a year and then boop, it goes all the way up. And then we go to the next chart and it's been at, um, you know, well, where is it at? 25 basis points, 75 basis points, 100 basis points and 150 basis points. So something to just remember that it was the 4th of June um, or 4th, 4th of, uh, where is it here? Um, the 5th of June, sorry, uh, in 2019. Uh, it was actually the 4th of June, but I don't know why it says there, the 5th. The 4th was a Tuesday, I'm pretty sure. Um, that, that was the first rate cut uh, in June 2019. And when we look at June 2019, it came down from 150 basis points, right? So if we really look at where we're at at the moment, we're at 185 basis points, are at 150 basis points uh, two years ago, um, three years ago. And then when we go back and look through the data, right, we have 150 basis points for all of that time there, dating back to 2016, it was 150 basis points. So we're now in 2020, uh, 2022, and it's been six years seven years going on and we have seen the interest rates go up down and then back up again everyone's freaking out but we only have interest rates to where they were going back um when was it 2016 august 2016 so when we look at that um you know it may seem like a lot right but um that's because we've come off from nothing when we look at the interest rates where it's been for many times before that and, and all that, we go back through this data. There's some interesting notes to be taken from this, um, as well as the fact that in reality, we've seen the interest rates not go up for a decade. It's been 12 years since they went up, uh, it was 2010. And then we've seen that they've gone up four times, they've got up the massive, massive amounts and a very quick time frame. Uh, people are thinking, okay, well, it's going to go to 5%, it's going to go to 20%. I've got some other charts to overview, and these are two charts from today from the same place, and I want to share with you specifically what I'm seeing and when I think that interest rates will be going down. So every media outlet out there is talking about uh, interest rate rises. Every media outlet out there is talking about um, you know where things are going to, and uh I actually believe that we will see rates come down in the very short term. So um, let's go back and have a look at a few more charts here. Uh, so we've got interest rates at 2% for a very long time. And then this was the downhill slope all the way down to 0.10% or 10 basis points. Um, and we have a look here. Uh, we started seeing the current the, the cash rate drop in May 2012 from 
two five percent um, and then it was at five percent so we have a look here and this is where it gets interesting because it's been a long time since interest rates have gone up but the first rate cut so the interest rates have dropped since 2nd of November 2011 all right that's when they started dropping from 4.75 percent they came down in there we've had trillions of dollars of debt we've seen two big property market booms in that period of time and um, yeah it's all become from cheap crash trashy cash um, but what I think is important is have a look from the peak to trough so here we have here the first rate cut was in 20 November 2011 but then we had the last rate hike in May 2010 so that was about 14 16 months that we saw here in between those two dates when the interest rates stopped going up and when we started to see the interest rates coming down but then if we look at 2010 we saw interest rates went up one two three four five times since november 2009 to may 2010 interest rates went up um, massively over that period of time and we saw a new property boom and, oh sorry we also had october 2009 but then we saw interest rates, look at this. So October 2009 was the first up, but April 2009 was the last cut, right? And then we had a 1% cut, a 1% cut, a 75 basis percent cut, a 1% um, cut, 25 basis point cut. So between the 3rd of September, that's when the GFC really kicked in, right? That's when the GFC really, really, really blew up. And those um four months so it went down four percent interest rates dropped from 7.25 percent all the way down to three percent in a period of five months there uh, why did that happen that happened because of the gfc but then when we look at this right we look at the interest rate dropped uh 4.25 percent over a period of a few months uh gfc had occurred and um what happened before that interest rates had gone up 25 basis points 25 basis points 25 basis points the last interest rate increase was the 5th of march 2008 and then the first cut was on the 3rd of september so that wasn't even six months between the last increase and the first cut that had occurred so just it's important to bear this in mind because you know you can go and watch the news and be told about all the doom and gloom right but when we go and overlay, you know, all the poor bastards in 2009, what happened in 2009, you know, you'd hate to have bought a property in Sydney for 200 grand in 2009 that it happened to be worth a oh, measly million or a million and a half today. But anyway, that was six months between interest rates going up and then interest rates coming down. And then we go back through history. Um, they're pretty boring, right? Like, pretty similar to where we're at at the moment nothing had occurred in 2007 there was one two three three interest rates in between 2005 and 2007 so two years there was nothing had occurred there was three slight increases but then we had a few big increases like it was like month after month after month right just have a look here we had um november february march three increases and then we saw them come down by 66 percent uh, interesting number anyway but 66 percent they came down within four months and then we go and have a look at what happened between 2003 they just slowly went up and the market went sideways we had some stagflation there and then we look back in 2001 and the late 1990s uh, so we had 99 you know they went up 25 basis points 20 50 basis points 25 25 25 and then in start of 2001 before september 11 by the way interest rates ma magically came down a half percent and then they came down another 25 then another half percent and then in september 2001 they came down another quarter another quarter another quarter why did that occur um, it was a very different 
time and a very different era in that period of time. So if you go back to 1990, don't worry about these pages, they're just in the 90s. But I think it's very important to, to look back at this data. And um, I might share the link to this in Birchfeed, right? So if you're in Birchfeed, I will share this with you later on tonight. Um, but yeah, we saw interest rates go up a fair bit. And then we saw the wherever the pages, and then we saw the GFC hit. Rate cut, rate cut, rate cut, rate cut, rate cut. Right? And uh, now we have seen interest rates, they couldn't lift interest rates for a decade, right? Everybody's been hooked up to debt and suddenly they go up by 200, uh, 20 times. Right? What would that be? 10 basis points over almost 200 basis points. That would be 20 times that the interest rates have gone up. They've gone up 20 times in four months. 120 days, the amount has gone up to 20 times. So 20 times would be 2,000%, right? 2,000% interest rates have gone up in a period of four months. So what would happen if interest rates went up by 2,000% in four months, right? Well, the market simply can't support it, right? The market cannot support it. I'm gonna share with you two charts here, which are very important. So I made sure, I made strict instructions. Carolyn, can you please print this chart today before 12 o'clock, right? And I knew it would be changing. And she printed it out. And then when, just before I came on live, I said to Carolyn, hey, can you print this again? She goes, I just printed it. And I was like, no, no, it's changed, right? Let's just have a look at it. And we overlay them. And I want to show you some differences that have occurred today. So. I've been sharing this with you for a long time and you can see now the steepness is sort of plateauing out because it's almost at its top level, right? But I've always said, you don't worry about what's on this side because we know the trajectory of the monetary policy. You don't see monetary policy go up this month, down next month, up the month after, down the month after. They push it up, then they go shit and they push it down. And I said that this end will slowly plateau out and it'll come back this way, right? And it's when we see that wave come back is when we're going to see the interest rate cuts reoccur. So also everyone's scared that they're paying an extra few bucks, right? I know sure as shit because I've physically calculated it, right? Let's just go through a typical investor, right? I've always talked about building a recession-proof property portfolio, which is why I've built my portfolio. I've been buying through all those market cycles there. Um, I've been buying in 2003, 2005, 2008, 2010. I've been buying through every time they've gone up and down. And, um, you know, I need to overlay this data. So when I say that I want to build a recession-proof property portfolio, I talk about buying below market value. It's got upside for growth and it's got a strong cash flow. Very important principles. And the new principles today of making sure that it's below replacement cost for infrastructure cost to put into the property is very important because of inflation. And, uh, and finally, is making sure that servicing can afford it. So something really bad is about to happen. Right? Something really, really bad. It'll happen to the property market, it'll happen to crypto market, it'll happen to shares. Um, fortunately for property is that it's very, you know, it's not liquid, right? Property market's not liquid. It'll take a while for desperate sellers to come into the market. No one's gonna go bank repo on a 3% interest rate, a 4% interest rate at the bank, whatever, right? So it, you don't see the price go and fall off a cliff, but you do when you see the stock market, you do when you see your super fund, you do when you see your crypto market. And um, I think it's very important to understand this. So if you have a mortgage of $200,000 and the interest rate goes up by 1% or a half percent, let's just use today's interest rate rise, right? Interest rate goes up by a half percent, um, half percent of 200 grand is a thousand bucks. A thousand bucks is fifty dollars is twenty dollars per week. So your mortgage has gone up by two hundred bucks, uh, twenty dollars per week. So if it's gone up four times, it's now gone up eighty dollars per week. Imagine you're one of those people, and I joke about stuff all the time, right? My mortgage is a, a lot, and uh, you know, as is a lot of other people's, right? Um, 
But a lot of people, and I, when I say a lot, I mean probably 60% of the population, are always trying to get their highest amount of loan capacity that they can. So if you go to a new Greenfield area, just around my office, let's go to Bella Vista, they might be looking at $2 million mortgage on a $3 million house. Um, you might be going to Kellyville, which would be you know a $1.5 million house with a $1 million mortgage. A lot of people have a $1 million mortgage today is what I'm trying to say. So if we have a $1 million mortgage and that goes up by a half percent, that means it's cost an extra five grand a year or a hundred bucks per week. So when we overlay this data, right, just think about this, right? Back in 2008, back in 2003, back in 1990, back in 2010, people didn't have million dollar mortgages, but now everyone's got a million dollar mortgage, right? Um, it, it's, you know, it, it makes a big impact. So a half percent increase is five grand a year. It's gone up 2% already. So that's now an extra 20 grand a year. So anyone that's got a million dollar mortgage out there is now losing 20 grand a year. So someone that's on a, a, a mortgage of 200 grand, they can just put up their rent by 50 bucks and they're no change in their life. Um, someone that's on a million dollar mortgage has to go get a second job, has to go get a third job, have to get their five-year-old child into working in a job. Um, to pay the bills and then they go to the grocery store and they can't afford to buy it. It's the difference between do we get, oh, do we buy the baby formula or do we buy the baby nappies, right? And they're decisions that people, I'm assuming, would have to go and make out there because it's physically you know, impossible for people to be able to afford these things. So um, something needs to give within that system. So when I look at um, you know, these interest rates going up, it's going to cripple the whole economy. And then when you don't have spending in cafes and restaurants and businesses start going into trouble, what starts to occur at that point? We end into a big recession. And what do they do in a recession? <laughs> we saw we didn't even enter into a recession in the start of 2020 and they dropped interest rates leading up to that. Surprise, it's like they knew that something was going to happen. They dropped the interest rates, right? But anyway, we avoided a recession by dropping interest rates going back two years ago to zero. So... When we look at the world we're in, we're gonna make a decision and go, how long is it gonna take for people to stop buying things they need to see that we're in a full-blown recession? A recession, what is the technical definition of a recession? I could go and Google it, or it, I could just explain it to you. It is two negative quarters of GDP, which is of growth. We have seen um, the interest rates rising over four months. So we're almost at six month point. We haven't seen any data flow through of things that have gone wrong. Every single day we're seeing companies go bankrupt, people letting off staff. So we're going to end up in a position very, very soon. And I predict this time would be somewhere between October to November this year that we will see um, a lot of companies having to report because that's reporting season of all their results. The companies are doing their tax returns at the moment. When I say the companies, I mean the stock list of companies, the ASX companies, the Dow Jones companies, all these companies that are on the stock market out there are starting to do all their reporting in the financial year. But what about when they come out and they say, oh, well, the last quarter's down negative 2% and the quarter before that's down another 2%, we will be technically in a recession. The US is in a recession. So at that point, uh, we see everything block. We now have petrol very high. People can't people can't afford petrol, so they don't, they don't have a job. Right? They won't have a job. People can't afford to buy food, but the petrol's still high. Right? We're in a really really dangerous position. So we're going to be at a point where they're going to have to print so much money, and they're going to have to lower these rates again to stimulate the economy to keep it going. And when we look at that, this here draws a bit of a picture. So. This morning, it said this was the current interest rate. Brian, Brian Freddie, I was actually going to get a line and say that it was going to be half percent, but I couldn't be bothered because it's just obvious what's going to happen. So a half percent here is where it would have ended up today. If you notice here, the very important parts that I've highlighted, right? 
This here is 3%, which is where this end is, right? The end of it is at 3% in December 23. And you've got all these bright spark economists that are out there going, ooh, it's going to peak at 3% or at 3.2%, right? Because they're just reading this data. But they're not understanding that this data changes by the day, right? And I'll show you in two seconds about how it changes. And they don't see that this could very quickly fall off a cliff and rise back to here. And we could see back down to 0%. Uh, in the next six months. I could be wrong too, guys. It could be wrong. So don't make any decisions based on me. But here we are. 3% is where the end of the cycle is. And the upper bound is almost at 3.4%. Right? That's where it caps out there. So this was taken somewhere before 12 o'clock today. And this one is the one that was taken about 6.30 tonight. So when we have a look at it, we can see that it tops out now at 3.2%. Right? So the top end has now lowered. Right? And then we go right to the end, which was 3% beforehand, and now it's 2.8% on the lower end. So within six hours, this now here has lowered by another 20 basis points. And that's very important knowledge to have. So we can start to see the yes monetary policy is starting to lose its sort of, you know, run here. Um, and even if you look at next month, what was that 2%, 2.4%. So this morning, this morning's one, this one here was running at 2.47, right? That is October 2022 at two, this one here, I'll make it easier. October is 2.47. Right, is where they expect interest rates to be. But then when we look at it six hours later, October is now 2.4%, right? So let's wait a couple of months, wait for a few more companies to go bankrupt and a few things to happen. We'll start to see this taper down and we'll start seeing this move back and we'll start seeing a different change in monetary policy. That is my view on that. And I'll keep these charts here. I won't throw them away because I'm sure you've got questions about it, so keep the questions coming through. Got given some news articles to talk to you today about, um, which this one here is an interesting one. I actually provide the news articles for my team to print out and put on my desk before this, but this one here was just one that they threw in. Uh, it's a, from the ABC, the Australian Communist Broadcasting uh, Network. Interest rate update. Shock horror. RBA increases rate for the fourth consecutive month. Curb rising inflation as it happened. Oh, it's like the buildings are falling down. Shadow of Treasurer says government needs to assist the RBA. Okay, that's a really interesting thing, right? So what is the conversation starting to come out? I haven't even got this article right. But just from the headache, headline, headache, uh, headline, Shadow Treasurer says the government needs to assist. How do they need to assist the RBA, you may say? Treasurer says latest rate hawk will sting Australians. Well, people are getting fucked really badly right now, right? So this isn't a time to panic. It's a time to sink, sit there, think, and be strategic about your moves. Um, Treasurer, uh, RBA confirms it thinks... The RBA confirms that it thinks inflation will hit 7.75% this year. Um, I'm just laughing in my head because my mate posted a Bitcoin one the other day with a lady, two different ladies, right? And uh, the one said, this is the real inflation. And this is the one that's reported, right? It was a pretty funny meme. But reality of it is, is that um, the... Uh, inflation, I don't know what has gone up by 7.75%. Everything's gone up higher than that, right? We can't see these things fall because if inflation goes up and then it falls too far, then what we're going to start seeing is all of the companies that have bought inventory, stock, whatever, go broke, right? They're going to have to put off staff. They're going to have to close down their stores. I go over to the little shopping center across from my office and I see constantly there's like holes in the walls where the shopping center's got you know, businesses that have gone broke. So we're going to start seeing this really start to flow out. There's, you know, it's it's interesting. It's interesting, never say the less. So here's an article here from news.com. And it reads, Australian property prices remain stubborn, cling to pre-illness levels. 
Property prices are going down slightly, but they still remain stubbornly high compared to pre-scandemic levels. House prices are just 1.66% below their peak in the later half of last year. According to PropTrack's home price index released on Monday, home prices dropped by 0.43% nationally in July. However, they still remain way out of reach for the average person. Well, they're a lot further out of reach now when they're still at their peak and the cost of the money to buy it has gone up 2,000% in the last four months, right? And, you know, the cost of them has gone up by almost double, right? That number was exacerbated in regional areas. Properties are 48.8% higher than before the said illness uh, was on Australia's shores. Yeah, okay. Um, nationally, the house and unit prices remain 32.9% above March 2020 levels. Sydney and Melbourne suffered the biggest falls this both and falls this both and both Sydney and Melbourne suffered the biggest falls this both and are both down more than three percent for the year so far doesn't even make sense anyway wow the Sydney property markets dropped by a total of three percent in a year interesting number but anyway three percent right we've just seen interest rates go up by two thousand percent right at the RBA the cash rate went from 10 basis points to almost 200 basis points. Um, almost 2,000%. It's gone up 20 times at that. Um, and it's gone down by 3%. Okay. The report found that house and unit values will fall between 2 and 5% nationally for the rest of the year. But next year, the results were even more extreme, with values to forecast to plunge between 7 and 10% in 2023, with the author's report noting that they would potentially bring prices down 15% from current levels. Oh, wow. All right? I haven't seen a market correction before in anyone. But most importantly, do you remember when we read out the news articles going back two weeks ago? They said that every single property cycle throughout all those times. What's very important to look at is the actual data. As I said before, and if you are a homeowner and you own the place with a million dollar mortgage on it and you're having to go to work and pay extra for that, 2% increase in the interest rate on a million dollar mortgage, no one's ever had these mortgages beforehand, right? Um, we are stuck at a zero interest rate policy. So they can try and rise interest rates how quickly will they have to reduce them? And I think, and we can see very clearly that we are now, where are we here? We are now seeing a change on their forecasting, right? And this is where money flows with the rates. So we've seen interest rates go up, but very quickly we're starting to see this end. So what will this end look like after a few more days, after a few more weeks, after a few more months? it could look like something like this. But we need to look at the other data, which is jobs figures, which is all bullshit anyway. But when we look at the companies that are not making money, right, their expenses have gone through the roof. Their cost of funding has gone up 2,000%, right? Because businesses that have taken out debt at, you know, business rates, which is much different than what you're paying, the government has taken out debt at 10 basis points, not what you're paying but at 10 basis points and now it's gone up to two, 200 basis points that's gone up 2000 percent so when we start seeing that data just remember these words october november 2022 is when we will i believe we'll start seeing instability and the real recession will be here and we saw when the recession comes, they drop interest rates 60% over a couple of months. So, you know, you can sit here, get freaked out, read the news, you know, whatever. Or you can just be like, okay, cool, shit's happening. And how can I benefit from it? And that's the exciting part we're all about to share with you. So, the ambitious plan, right, this isn't it. What was my other article? I'm sure I had another article here, right? We'll get into this one anyway. The ambitious plan to end homelessness and rental stress in Australia is just in just a decade. Realestate.com, which is still news.com. Um, let's read it out. 
A bold new plan could end homelessness in Australia within a decade, providing a roadmap for the government to overhaul housing amid a rental crisis. Oh, do we have a rental crisis, did someone say? <laughs> uh, imagine having a rental property and seeing those rents go up. It'd be bad to be a tenant, might be bad to have the mortgage, but when those rates go up, when the rents go up, right? Imagine when the rents go up, 100 bucks and then the rates drop down 100 bucks what's that going to do for your cash flow goes on to read uh, the, there's some non-profit homelessness australia launched a major report calling on the commonwealth to make meaningful action to address the dire situation facing hundreds of thousands of people as well as ending homelessness the plan outlines a pathway to halving instances of rental stress within five years and for good by 2032 very interesting, around 2030 this may be. Housing is at the forefront of Australia's cost of living crisis, which is pushing more and more people into homelessness. Homelessness Australia Chair Jenny Smith said, rents are skyrocketing while we have a social housing shortfall of 433,000 properties. Interesting number once again, 433, there we go. But it just goes to show that we are short nearly a half a million dwellings still. So. They ain't going to be building more dwellings when all the builders are broke and it costs too much to get the stuff to build the place. The place has to go up in value, so they have to artificially stimulate it again. In the past year alone, the median rent at the national level has surged by 13.2% and some hard-hit areas have skyrocketed by up to 25%. As rents rapidly rise alongside growing cost of living pressures, the need to do more with, to avoid people fall, falling into insecure or unstable accommodation is more vital than ever. While the situation is dire, the challenge is not in, in surmountable, insurmountable. We can end homelessness for women, children, young people, Indigenous Australians, and dramatically reduce the number of people returning to homelessness services. A big but worthwhile investment. The plan calls for the government to build 25,000 social housing dwellings per year, another 25,000 properties for low income earners. Well, that's not really gonna happen. The report also recommends that the housing guarantee for women and children fleeing from family violence. That's really bad. Um, don't like that. Uh, talking about you know, family violence and stuff like that. It also calls for an increase of at least, this is where it gets really exciting, folks. It also calls for an increase of at least $70 per day to job seeker, as well as 50% boost to the Commonwealth Rental Assistant payment. So if the rent's $500 and you get 50% of that given from the government, that means that it's going to be $250 coming from the government. And then if you've got a $70 per day, that's $370, 10 days, that'd be seven. That means a boost of about $500 per week to job seeker, right? Which is already, so it's a thousand bucks a week for the doll, right? a thousand dollars you wouldn't even want a job in the current climate right if you're getting a thousand dollars per week so these are things that are being talked about and previously i was ridiculed i was laughed at i was told to get off the drugs because i was talking stuff called universal basic income and a social credit system going back five years ago so interesting that here they are talking about ways on how to uh and homelessness and rental stress in Australia in a decade, and they're talking about printing more money, right? It all comes down to printing more money, but they can't print more money if it's too expensive because then everyone will go broke. So they have one option, which is to reduce those interest rates down, and there goes the, um, the piece of paper. We ended homelessness two years ago, the illness name that they call it, uh, a test case for the governments to roll out approaches that experts and advocates have been championed for years. Essentially ended homelessness in 2020 during the lockdowns. Stay at home orders demand a well resourced homelessness response and unconditional access to shelter. Anyway, we have a rental situation, right? Red alert, red alert. Rents are rising, right? So. If you have a property, then your cash flow is going up. Yes, your expenses are going up, your cash flow is going up, your expenses, if you've got three months before your rent goes up, six months before your rent goes up, plan for it to go up because that's what's happening. So then we move on to my next article.
Um, actually, I had this article here from the... Um, where was this from? This is from the ABC one. Um, there was a, there was a, there's an important part here, right? Is there a risk that RBA may go too far? We're seeing the fastest pace of rate hikes since 1994. We are moving at a very fast speed. The lags in the data mean that by the time we actually know we've gone too far, it might be too late. Oh, really fucking simple to be able to tell you that by pushing the interest rates up, it's going to be too late. But that's that's written there, right? This person, what's this person's name? Jessica. The, what's it say? Uh, Ch Carlos, Carlos Chacho um, is the guy who came out with the uh, very bright knowledge, right? The lags in data mean that by the time we actually know we've gone too far, it might be too late. <laughs> um, they've reiterated that they'll be watching consumers carefully. Well, let's start seeing when that data comes through. When will that come through? October, November, right? It's exciting. Um, uh, what have we got here? Um, you know, I can't be bothered reading this communist stuff. The writing's on the wall. The more they put these rates up, the better you are going to be on the other side, right? Because the bigger the stimulus package is going to be, people are going to be really screwed from this, right? And, um, you know, when I say they're going to be screwed, if they're not, if they're too indebted, if they don't have cash flow streams, if they don't have things that they can take with them through inflation, inflation is going to get a hell of a lot worse for people. A hell of a lot worse. So, and on that note, right, on that note, let's read this article. And this article, I'm going to be reading it. I read shit for different reasons, right? I don't read this article going, oh yeah, Peter Dudd and backflips on petrol prices. I read through the haha <laughs> you checkmated right because they're not reporting on the facts they're just reporting on situations and it's like i can see you snooker right if you're playing a game of chess or you're playing a game of you know whatever you you can see your opponent and you can see where they're being cornered so did that just happen peter dudden flat back flips on petrol prices peter dudden has made an extraordinary decision to grill the prime minister over one thing despite his previous opposition um during question time on monday opposition leader peter dudden took he took to his feet to ask why the government had ruled out extending the fuel excise cut the tax cut was put in place by the previous government to relieve hip pocket pressures at the Bowser, but it was always due to expire in September. Mr. Sleazy, who has repeatedly said that he would not expend the measure, laughed off the question. Did that just happen? Mr. Albert Sleazy asked. I point to the fact that Dutton was in the cabinet that put together the budget. It had an end date for the measure he talks about, abandoning its attacks on the decision to scrap the construction watchdog coalition used question time to quiz the government about the cost of living crisis beginning with question on electricity bills mr but and opposition climate spokesman ted o'brien attempted to nail sleazy's promise for cheaper power prices the prime minister fired back by saying the former government knew before the election prices were going up but kept australians in the dark it's interesting talking about from light to dark anyway um meanwhile in in the nosebleed section of the house former prime minister scamo took onto his seat at the back bench for the first time in a decade before proceedings kicked off shorten the only other man in the house to know exactly how the former foes shared firm handshake and a laugh before the ndis i can't even be bothered reading all this right it's all in this part here let's go back during question time on monday the opposition leader took to his feet and asked why the government had ruled out extending the fuel excise cut. The tax cut was put in place by previous government to relieve the hip pocket pressure at the Bowser, but always was due to expire in September. Let's just think about that, right? Let's get rid of the rest of this paper so we can get on our next, next article. But the thing is, is that they dropped the petrol price by, they took away the tax of 22%. What happens in September when that disappears, right? And they have to add the extra 20% tax back on. That would mean that the cost of petrol would go up by 20%. 
Now, if you were Lynn Fox, which is a truck company, you've just passed another Fox, right? Those red and white trucks, you see, red and yellow trucks you see. If their costs go up by uh, 20% to drive that truck, what are they going to do? They're going to pass that on to the Woolworths, the fresh food people, you know, if you call chemicals fresh, but whoever shit they're carrying in that truck, they're going to have to put the cost of that up. So the inflation is going to be passed back on. So we're going to see even more inflation. <laughs> so around September, be prepared that your cost of food, your cost of everything is going to start rising. That may take another month, two months, three months to trickle in. We haven't got that yet. There's more inflation coming, right? And they've inflated the cost of your household again this Tuesday because they've increased your interest rates. Anyway, these are all odd things to be watching, but that's what the story was about, and that was the crucial part of the story. Here's another one from the Commie News Network, ABC. Even with historic fall in house prices, rents are tipped to rise by as much as 10%. Will they ever go down? Let's read that again. With Even with a historic fall in house price. What? The last article said that they've dropped by 3% in a fucking year from the top of the market. The market doesn't just sit at the top. It hits a point and comes down a little bit. It's just normal. It's a normal market. But anyway, the largest history fall in house prices. I'm sure that these fucking people that are writing these articles don't even own a fucking house. <laughs> and they're writing about historic fall in house prices. You want to be asking, you want to be questioning yourself. Who writes these articles? Who who are these people? What is their belief system? How commie are they? <laughs> what do they own to their name? What colour is their hair? What colour little lapel do they put on with all different things on it? Huh? What do these people have going for them to be putting out this rubbish? Right? <laughs> They're literally prop putting out propaganda when people go, oh, Nathan, oh, I've read in the news that this is this, right? Read from the news. Read from fucking some of the brains or look and make your own decisions based on the data. The data is out there. The writing is on the wall, right? The bigger the increases, the bigger the stimulus checks are going to be. Well, that's what's happened through each and every single one of those times and cycles it's been. But anyway, let's read this fun article that we see here. <laughs> rents are tipped to rise by as much as 10%. Will they ever go down? Well, let me just tell you, right, besides someone that thinks and has critical thinking still left in their brain and someone that looks at data, which is actual figures and prognosticates based on that data and the levers that are being pulled. If you pull your steering wheel of your car this way, the car's going to fucking end in that direction. The car ain't going to go over there. The car ain't going to go, oh, maybe I'll just go straight, right? The car will go right if you turn right. So when you look at monetary policy, it's got to go one way, right? It's not as, it's very fucking simple sort of thing. But anyway, one thing I know sure as fuck is that I manage thousands of properties around the country, right? I manage thousands of properties. And I don't know anywhere that's gone up by 10% in the last year. I put up maybe twice a year by 15, 20%. Some of my investors, 200 bucks a week rent gone to 300 bucks a week. They're under rented. The markets are hot. Things are going up. So these guys are saying we're going to see potentially a 10% increase, right? Rents are going up much greater than that. Anyway, with news that house prices are falling sharply in several capitals, how's 3% in a fucking year sharp? Anyway, that's what they're saying. <laughs> Must be true. Must be true. Let's go get our fourth booster. Anyway, millions of renters may be looking forward to paying the landlord a bit less. Core Dodgic, Core Dodgic, Core Logic data released this week shows house prices in Australia dropping at their fastest pace since the global financial crisis. Well, how about you go tell all the people that bought in mining towns years ago at 500 grand and their house price fell 50 grand fell 90 percent over a couple of years that this is the fastest pace right there's been places that have fallen in the last decade by 90 percent there's literally suburbs in australia that have had a 90 percent loss in their property value in the last decade and i read this shit going oh you know they're falling there sharply um the 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 fastest paced since the global financial crisis 
Anyway, there's only one thing dropping at the fastest rate, and you know, I'll let everyone believe or think about that a little bit more. Medium price in Sydney saw the sharpest value falls in most 40 years. There's our 40 again anyway. 40%, 40 years, 40 this, 40 that. While values in Melbourne and Hobart and Brisbane and regional Australia all dropped last month. So rents should fall too, shouldn't they not? Wrong. For most of the $2.4 million, $2.4 million households renting from private landlords, rents will go up at a historically rapid clip over the next years. Here's why. Prices go down, but rents keep going up. Rents have dropped about 2.8% in the past quarter and expected to rise further still. We've already seen rents up 9.8% over the last 12 months. By this time next year, I wouldn't be surprised if there was a similar increase around 10%. I should do this voice more often because it just sounds so fucking stupid reading out their comments a lot of this stuff. The chart below shows the relationship between develop, dwelling, houses and apartment values and weekly rents from 2010 to 2022. doesn't really fucking look that great. Since August 2020, the fairly flat and predictory trajectory in the rental payment increase has taken a sharp upwards turn. So when they're saying that everyone's going to have to have rents going down and no one pay their rent and stuff, look what happened here. Boop. Anyway, the rental market's shifting bulge. There's only one bulge out there. But there's another long-term trend that's also driving up rents because the cost of buying houses is unaffordable for many. Australians are renting longer than their lives, in their lives and into what Martin calls the prime income years. Who's this Dr. Martin? <laughs> Bitch, it's that old miserable bloke, eh? Let's have a look here. Oh, no, it's a different Dr. Martin, different one. I'll take that back. They are higher income houses and can spend that higher income on rental housing. So when everyone's sitting there saying to me, Nathan, by the year 2030, you'll own nothing and be happy. Uh, I said to you guys, is it that they're going to take your houses? All the guys that are smoking a little bit too much and people are scared, reading too, artic too many articles about the guys that have smoked too much, sitting there saying, oh, by 2030, you'll own nothing, be happy. Yes, it's satanic and they are you know, have agendas that people will know nothing, right? So you'll be renting shit for your whole life. You don't own your car, you're renting it. You're paying your finance on your car, whatever the case may be. But in 2030, why won't people be able to buy? Why won't they own? The reason being is that inflation will push the cost up so high, it'll be mathematically impossible for people to afford to do so. And I think that's where the opportunity is for investors so hold on to your assets a lot of people are scared if you are scared and you own a property and you want to get rid of that property reach out to me right because i'll do some terms let's do some cool deals if you guys want to sell your property and you're scared talk to me let's have some fun we'll do some deals i'll pay you what you want for your property but on my terms your price my terms there's one for you quickest message i'm happy to chat send me the details but my terms are very different than a traditional instance. So just be mindful of that. Um, be mindful of the trajectory of monetary policy. It is changing, it is shifting. We can see here, I can see just in these charts, these two charts from today, they've changed. Right? On that note, I'm gonna look at a couple of questions. I was told today, don't go over 30 minutes. We've got a big webinar tomorrow talking about, um, you know, where things are going to all that if you guys are watching this you guys have a bit more questions have whatever you need to be on that webinar tomorrow i don't have a link on this screen maybe someone could put a link to the webinar um you can see it on the be invested page it is on wednesday the 3rd of august um is, is when the webinar is make sure you come along to that i will read a few of your questions i will answer them but i think in short um it's very important to question what's going on right we have the system is getting blown up. You've got people that have never owned a property, people that don't know shit about how business works, they've never had a job outside of some commie organization, and they are saying, oh, well, this is gonna happen, and that's gonna happen, and this is the decision we're gonna make. 
Reality is go to your local shop and ask them how business is. They'll tell you a lot of stories. Every time you go to a shop, go to your hairdresser, go to wherever, and the um, ask them how's things going, how's business going, all that sort of stuff, because they like to talk and share what's happening. So just very um, important. Um, so when we get into that recession that gets deeper, and when you go back to 1992 and it's the um, recession that we had to have, um, it's this is the recession we need to have, but it's not going to end just at a recession. We're going to see all this data overflow, and it's, it's when these reporting come out on the stock market, we're going to see a stock market crash. So if you've watched this video for long enough, um, I have two more predictions. So one is that interest rates will come down. And I said, probably not before 12 months, which were four months in, maybe another six months, maybe another eight months, maybe another 12 months, but won't be past two years. We've looked at all the previous times there of when interest rates have gone up and when they've done their thing. Um, so that's the first thing, is interest rates will come down. They may go up one more. I think they may go up another half percent. They're saying that they could go up by another one percent. I think it would be very unlikely for them to go up by another one percent, but somewhere in that two and a half percent, it'll probably tap out. But I think we'll see them come down very, very sharply as we enter into a very deep recession. And the only way to get out of that is to stimulate the economy. So getting on to my non-financial advice, right? Uh, I am a very well-researched, um, calculated sort of person on when I make decisions and when I do things and I want to know how it all adds up. Um, so just on my synopsis, right? if we start seeing all these companies that have been zombie companies that have been reporting that they've been doing great but they've been doing no business or they can't get stock or whatever, we're going to see a shit ton of companies start blowing up after October, November this year. So if you're invested in the stock market, it might be considering looking at your position. And I'm no financial advisor. I'm not going to be giving you financial advice on that. Um, but most importantly, if you think, oh, well, I'm not in the stock market, right? Your, if you've got a super fund, your money is invested into shares and Ponzi schemes and cat shit wrapped in dog shit, all different things that they're wrapped up as financial instruments. Um, and you would be exposed to those markets. So be very careful with your super fund. If you have a super fund, reach out to my team. You can flick us a message, give us an email at admin at beinvested.com.au. I can put you in contact with someone to discuss your super fund that can give you that advice. I'm not qualified to do that. I don't profess to be, but I'll put you in contact with someone to make sure that you protect yourself as we go through this phase. This is a very dicey phase that we are going through and it's important to make the right decisions. So look at um, <laughs> look at uh, uh, your questions, guys. Kane said here, liking your trading analysis, cash rate futures volatility reminds me of ICOs in 2017, 100%. Um, Matt said CPI equals dog shit, it is. Uh, whatever scenario which is most likely to justify bringing in a digital currency is what will occur. I believe we will see a digital currency on the back of this. I always said, um, <laughs> breaking Bunnings inventory added to the RBA assets, 100%. Um, I always said that we would see a hyperinflation it wouldn't happen before three years and it would happen after that. We would probably see interest rates correct for a period of 12 months or so, but I only expected that they'd go up by 20, a 225 basis point increase. So a half percent I expected them to go up to max. I didn't expect them to go up a whole 200 basis points almost, 175 basis points. So very um, interesting. I'm surprised that they've gone that far and uh, the 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 ramifications of their decisions that they've made will have really big impacts on a lot of people negatively, but it'll also have a lot of positive to come from that. Um, Matt just asked, do you think interest rates will go below zero uh, or do you think they'll do some dodgy canning and wipe out debt with CBDCs? Uh, I believe that we will go to some really commie digital currency, which will be a social credit system. It'll be installed in one of your digital wallets that you were forced to have from probably doing not this thing, but doing this thing by putting 
you know, the roll up your sleeve thing, um, everyone seems to have a new wallet that they can go and access to. So it might be installed inside of that. Uh, so yeah, um, I believe that will go to negative. Uh, Spiros, people need to stop looking at what the banks are doing. It all balances over the life of the loan. Buy, low, sell, low, buy, high, sell, high. Rates fluctuate in the same way as property values do. 100% they do. Um, Gussie said, uh, what happened to the negative interest rates you were guaranteeing? Well, we got to 10 basis points when interest rates were not anywhere near that. And everyone's saying interest rates were going up, but they didn't go negative. Uh, if we look at really where the interest rates were, they were at a zero bound level. And I still believe that we're going to see them go to that level. Just wait until we see the, the end of this cycle, which we're seeing on the chart. So um, I'm still you know, very, very uh, much of that mindset and view. Um, I'm quitting work and getting on the rock and roll. 2024, they said interest rates going up. This government is going for the kill. Exactly, right? The government has no way of controlling it, right? But the RBA said to you guys, everybody watching this, um, and I, I, sometimes I feel like are people having a dig because interest rates didn't go negative, going, oh, ha, you got it wrong, right? I, I'm not alleging that that's the case, but sometimes people do do that. And it's like, well, I actually got it to the date of saying what was going to happen to it. It got down to 10 basis points, which is basically zero, uh, but they couldn't go below zero because the banks weren't set up for that. They weren't set up to be able to take negative interest rates. But our elected officials and the people from the RBA that everyone wants to go trust so much and they sit on side the news and give, you know, their nice conversation about it, which isn't as raw and uncut as what I do, um, they all told you all that interest rates wouldn't go up until 2024. Well, how's that going? Um, you know, how's it going for everyone now? Uh, <laughs> Mainstream media garbage, and then we've got Gemma that says new readers they read a script. So anyone that reads a script, that's uh, very you know important. Um, thanks for the shout out there, uh, saying the confidence of being smart. Thank you. Uh, real talk. I just say it as it is. Um, a twenty-four year old talking about history drop and truth bomb exactly. Hey, someone told me apparently the cheap plant-based vegan meat with bugs taste tastier <laughs> but got chemicals in it probably nothing exactly right don't drink cow's milk because that might be good for you drink cockroach milk that was an article i saw um yeah uh what time is that on nathan uh tomorrow is um the webinar is on at seven o'clock tomorrow night um reach out to the team admin at be invested .com .au. Uh, there'll be a message inside of this comment box of how we'll get it pinned on how to uh, register for the webinar tomorrow, which, um, yeah, I don't know if it's there or not, but check it out a little bit later. Uh, reach out to my team and we'll get you the link for it. So just so then everyone in the community knows the time. Thank you. Yep, 7 o'clock. Um, Andrea here has posted the link to it. You can click on the link in the description from Andrea. Uh, thanks for that, Andrea. I'm just going to give you a little like on that so everyone knows that that's the one. Uh, where do you think will be the perfect time to buy in Melbourne and Sydney and Brisbane in the current market and Ford? That is a very important question, and uh, I might leave on that. Um, um, I'm going to I'm going to come back to that. I'll leave that as my parting question. Um, uh, Nick said, when do you think interest rates will come down? I just said uh, probably within 12 months that they'll come down. <laughs> um, uh, Jerry, I'm going to be calling you tomorrow, mate, uh, just regarding your tax question that you had. Um, so you're saying the back of this, Nathan, there will be a digital currency like Bitcoin, Ethereum attached to your MyGov. It will not be like Bitcoin or Ethereum, but it will be a digital currency. You will not be able to pull cash out of an ATM. The ATMs are disappearing. The accessibility to cash is disappearing. I've asked the banks. There's a few banks around me. Half of them have shut down. The others have gone to really nice cafe-looking cafe banks. And I've asked the banks, why did you move from over there to over here and build a big new you know, thing? You've been there for 15 years and your bank like, feels like a bank. Why are you here for? And they said, we needed to have these banks to be able to teach the elderly as they come in how to use tech. So there's like all these trees hanging down and really funky. It feels very different than a bank. There's no screens up or anything like that. And the reason why they're doing these banks is that they're getting everyone to go online. But 
you know, at a push of a button, they can turn your money off, they can take your money, they can confiscate you, they can lock you out of the system. So it's a very scary world for a lot of people that will be going into that. Don't think by at all that it's that it's good. Um, do you think precious metals has a place? Yes, very much so. Everyone should have precious metals. Don't get too much of it. It doesn't bring in a cash flow, but it is important. It is a hedge. It is a, you know, a war chest. So, yeah. Um, uh, cool. Uh, and Robbie said, big shout out to Andrew for putting the link in there. If you want to register, please click on that link that Andrew put in there. It works. I've just done it. So, awesome. So, I'm going to go back to my last question that I'm going to answer for the night. And then, um, where do you think I'd be a perfect time to buy? Where do you think? Where do you think it'd be a perfect time uh, to buy Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane in the current market and Ford? Be very cautious of this market. A lot of people are like, "I'm going to hold off to buy," right? And you might find some bargains. So right? there's always a bargain out there to be had. Um, but. And I'm finding them definitely in Sydney at the moment. Just reminders, I need to reply to someone's email about a bargain I just got. There was a property in Sydney for 299000 which sold six, seven years ago for 380000 which uh, which is pretty cool. But I see so many times where people are trying to time the market. Imagine people going, well, I'm going to buy when the market crashes with Corona, right? And in February 22, everyone's going to wait till November 2022. Just think about that, right? 20, uh, sorry, February 2020, everyone's going to wait to November 2020 to go and buy. Thing is, is the market took off. No one saw those stimmy checks coming out. The market took off and people were like, oh, I can't buy. And then the market went up and it doubled. Um, if you want to build a portfolio of 10, 15, 20, 30, 50 properties, whatever it is, if you're trying to buy one and trying to get that one bargain and think that you're so smart to outsmart the market, the market's going to beat you down because, you know, there's a couple of things, right? Firstly, if you want to buy 10 properties, you ain't going to buy 10 properties. You could buy 10 properties, but it's rare that someone will go and buy 10 properties within a six-month period. They might buy one and then another one next year, another one next year. If you're doing that, then you might get this year cheap, but next year you're going to be paying more, right? So the markets go up. So you can't. You need to work out how you can get the maximum amount of portfolio to get you to where you need to be. So for me, the biggest risk that I see everybody having today, and I'm going to leave you guys with this one to ponder over, the biggest risk that I see people having is that if you could have afforded to get a loan with a 3% interest rate, and interest rates do go up to 5%, that means that 5%, you may not surface for that loan. So you might be trying to find a bargain, but in reality, you can't get the loan for it, so you've got no money, and you're going to be a brokey to be able to go and afford that property, meaning that you can't have the assets that you wanted to accumulate before the market takes off. The only reason why the assets have gone up so high and have got their value is because people could service because interest rates were zero. As the interest rates go up, people can't afford and they can't service. So you need to really get the assets before the market crashes if the market was to crash. But how far can the market crash? It's dropped 3% allegedly in the news there this year from the peak of the market, which is pretty normal and I would accept that. But Let's say if the market comes back 10%, okay? Let's say the market drops by 40%. If the market drops by 40%, it's not going to happen. But let's say it dropped by 10, right? By the time you go and try and save that 10%, you can't get a loan no more. You can't service the debt because the bank won't be able to give you that loan based on your servicing and you need to be shit out of luck. And it's where I think a lot of people are going to get trapped because they're trying to time the market, but they're not thinking about the finance, right? There's a lot more to it than buying a property. The property is just a vehicle to get there. But if you've got no money, you ain't going to be able to buy it. If you don't have any money, if you don't have the, the right tools for the bank, you can't make it happen. So just my views and thoughts on that one. I want to thank everyone for tuning in this evening, uh, having me as a part of your home. I was going to try and keep it to a half an hour. Knew it wasn't going to be there. It's been over an hour. Uh, appreciate it. Thanks for sticking in there. Uh, do remember tomorrow night is uh, webinar night. Uh, I'm going to be talking about how to survive through a hyperinflation, how to survive with rising interest rates, how to survive with falling interest rates, how to take advantage of this market they're in. This could be one of the biggest and best webinars that I ever do. Make sure you tune in. The links are in the description. Um, and if you do want to book in a strategy session, you can reach out to my team. There is a link in the description section of this video. Reach out to my investor relation teams. Uh, you've seen Jeremy beforehand, you saw Gemma last week, I've got a whole team of investor relation managers 
have a chat with them. Uh, if it could just be, you know, what could I do? Where do I start? I've got this situation. How can I protect myself? They're not going to give you financial advice. They're going to put you in contact with the right people and give you some guidance and nurture you um, to, to get you to where you want to be. So on that note, if you are thinking of that, reach out. We don't buy it. And uh, it's a free call. It's a one number. We'll catch up soon. Thanks for watching, guys. Bye for now.